Yo, you know what it is. It's your boy DJ Filthy Rich. Yeah, it's your boy DJ Big X. And this is the We Outside Show. We back with another great episode. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe at the We Outside Show on all platforms. And today, we back on legendary status, man. We have <laughs> an Atlanta legend in the building. Make some noise for the one and only Ian Burke in the building. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. So, X going to talk all day and take over his interview because they're around the same era. But yeah, yeah man. This X and I go way back. Nah, yeah, he like, way. Like we, go, we go way <laughs> Y'all back. Kickball and shit. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to let you take it away, X. Let's nah, get it nah. I mean, you know, I've been knowing Ian for a long time, man. And, and I've been wanting to get a uh, sit down with Ian for, you know, we can always tell stories, but we never just sit down and just tell the real stories of how we both started in this and how we both got. Like a lot of people don't know, we go back to, before Outkast, before yeah. TLC, mm -hmm. like when Atlanta didn't even really have a music scene, yeah, we were like two of the guys that was like really pushing independent artists then. Like I think I had Y'all So Stupid, I think you yeah. were managing Too Crazy. Too Crazy. Y'all So um, Stupid and The King and I. Yeah. But King and I came after we got signed to uh, Rowdy. Rowdy, okay. But before when we was doing everything right then, yeah. I think when we started, it was supposed to be King and I, not King and I, Too Crazy, crazy. Y'all So Stupid. Y'all So Stupid, yeah. That's when LA and and Dallas had the label and they was gonna sign those two groups. But that was like me and your first, that was like, what was that, like 90? That was 90. One ninety. I won't say 90. 90 91, 92. Right. 92. Because so how old I, all of y'all around this time? How old are y'all around this time? I'm 27, okay. 27. I'm, I'm 20. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> make that face. I was twenty. Y'all were kids. I, was, I wasn't quite yeah. that old yet. Yeah. I was, but but it was a learning experience because during that time I didn't even know you was as well versed as you were in the business right. as far as what you was doing because during that time you was developing talent. I was just trying to find talent to produce. You were actually finding talent. So when you came in the city, what inspired you to get started in, in the business? Well. You know, I, I initially came down here um, to escape moving to Florida with my newly retired parents. I'm from Mount Vernon, New York. Okay. And, um, you know, it, it was just, I heard about Atlanta and, it, you know, it was a, you know, up and coming black mecca. It wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, quite there yet. Definitely nowhere near what it is today. Right. And uh, so I moved down here in 1984 to, to pursue a, um, a career in computers mm -hmm. going to DeVry and it just so happens that um one of my classmates played bass in a local band Arthur Brown played in a local mm -hmm. band called uh Hal Mel uh, Hal Melvin uh called Friends Inc but Hal Melvin comes in Hal Melvin and the Blue Notes how they come into relevancy is that we were opening they were opening for Hal Melvin and the Blue Notes mm -hmm. and Mr. V's figure eight wow you know what I'm saying and they needed help moving equipment mm. you know so that one night changed my life. That one night, moving equipment, setting it up. You know, we were in the club, you know what I'm saying? And um, um, if you were 20 in 92, yeah, you were- No, I was 21 in 92. 21, yeah. but you were still too young for this. <laughs> um, but I don't know if you remember, like uh, Sugar Ray Leonard was the Floyd Mayweather of our yeah, time. Yeah. Right. You know yeah. what I'm saying? He was in the club that night, right? Mm. And I, you know, I used to watch him fight on TV, and for him to just be floating around, and I got to shake his hand, mm. and I was like, "Yo, this is, <laughs> I won't be part of this." Right. Yeah. You know, so I just started. I was like, "Yo, let me, I'll move your equipment and stuff like that, and I'll do all that stuff for free." Mm. So I started, you know, renting the van, packing the gear up in the van and stuff like that, and, and setting it up for mm. them. And that's how I started. I started off as a roadie, right? With local bands. Wow. And so when you so you went from roadie to actually doing what after that? Um, after that, I I I wanted I was soaking everything up. You know what I'm saying? I was doing everything. Um, I was going to the uh, uh, I dropped out of DeVry, mm -hmm. studying computers, and then I went over to the Art Institute. Mm -hmm. Now the Art Institute had this um, damn uh, right there. program. Yeah, but see, this too. this is before <laughs> yeah. before. Like they had a, it was called the Music Business Institute, right? And it was encompassed within the Art Institute, and this was when it was right across the street from Linux Mall, right? And um, so I, I went there and was studying the whole commercial music program, which encompassed everything, you know, uh, video promotions, studio recordings. As a matter of fact, this studio here used to be called um, 
Boss Town? Not oh, Boss Town, oh, before, before Boss Town. Okay. Yeah. Um, I forgot the name of it. It'd be a rock but, group, right? No, nah, it was it, it was actually my classroom. Okay. You know what I'm saying? This it was, was your classroom? Yeah, uh huh. Damn. Yeah, that big studio they had the board and everything like that was my classroom. Wow. You know, we had we we went outside to real studios to learn studio recording techniques and things of that nature. Right. Um and I quickly found out that that was not my bag. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I couldn't do I couldn't do what they did. The old school engineers, the real engineers, not the cut and paste. Yeah. Pro Tools engineers, they had to slice tape. The real right. and oh, yeah, and 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 taped it back up and yo. Tell them about it. Tell yo, about man, it. it was crazy. <laughs> it was crazy. But they were getting paid the big bucks too. They were getting like seventy five, a hundred dollars an hour at Thank that you. point. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Now you can get an engineer, do Pro Tools for fifteen dollars an hour. hour right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um, you know, so I started learning all of that stuff and I started applying it. Even though I was going to school, like I, I was still moving equipment mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And then uh, I found, got a hold of um, uh, a, a video company based in New York that would shoot music videos. Mm -hmm. And I would fly, they were called Atlantis. I would fly to New York and I was part of the Round and Round video by Guy mm -hmm. and the Shake That Thing video by Salt and Pepper. I was a production assistant on both of those videos. You know what I'm saying? So I was learning that. And I, I was just absorbing everything, trying to figure out what I wanted to do in this business. Right. And, um, you know, and, and, and I kept going. And, and while I was in school, they were showing, uh, one of my classes showed a movie called The Idol Maker. Mm. And in The Idol Maker, in that movie, it was a, based on a true story about this guy who discovered two of the, uh, stars from the 50s, the music stars from the 50s, you know, like mm. Dion or something like that, right. you know. Um, and what this guy used to do, right, he would go and go to all the street magazine spots and he would read through all the fan magazines. They had Elvis on the cover and, you know, the Beatles and stuff like that. Mm. This is what he would do. Or all He would read through all of them. I adopted that as my thing. Mm -hmm. So I would go to, to the Grogers, the, the Winn-Dixies, the CVSs, and I would start reading Word Up, Fresh, Yo, Tiger Beat, Right On. Mm -hmm. I'd read all those magazines. I'd just see who, who, are they, who, are they, uh, who are they writing about. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that's what helped me, you know, put together some world-famous acts. Right. So when you came, I know, like, I first met you out just doing shows. We was doing shows, and I just kind of ran to you, and you was kind of managing too crazy. How did you? Because when I when I when I when I, when I seen you when I met you, you kind of like already knew everybody. Mm -hmm. You kind of already knew Jermaine. Right. You already had a relationship. This is before organized noise was organized noise. Yes, yes it was. Um, you kind of already I knew had Dallas a, too. I yeah, had a you had relationship Dallas with Dallas. Dallas too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you came, you already had these relationships. These were people that I met doing this whole beginning of this whole Atlanta music thing we was doing. Mm -hmm. How did you build those relationships, being that you was coming from New York? Um. Man, I just started doing different things. Like with Jermaine, one of my classmates at the school, at the Art Institute, mm -hmm. you know, he was like, Jermaine was like his kid baby brother. Like, you know, right. it was like, yo, you got to meet my, my baby brother. Mm -hmm. And he took me to his house on Judy Lane, mm -hmm. you know, before the money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, you know, introduced me to him. It was this cool cat. He had just come out with Silk Times Leather. Yep. You know, was doing his thing. And um, that's how I met J.D. With Dallas... Um, one of the bands that I was doing roadie work for was called Princess and Starbreeze. Deborah. Deborah Killings. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And um, let, let, let me tell you, boy, the whole Deborah <laughs> yeah. Killings thing. You got to talk about her. The whole Deborah Killings. This is the thing, right? So V103 was playing this record, this Prince remake called It's Gonna Be Lonely. And I used to love the record. And it was like, yo, this is a local band, whoa, 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 whoa. And I was like, who is this? Mm -hmm. Went to the store, went to uh, the record store, saw the cover, and fell in love with, with mm -hmm. Deborah. Like, mm -hmm. I literally felt, I was like, oh my God, and she plays bass too? Yeah. <laughs> and I started stalking the band. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I would show up at the shows, and her mom's was their manager at that time. Mm. And, um, you know, I went to uh, one of the shows, and I sat there, and, you know, uh, Alvin Spite was there doing the sound. Dallas was there as well because he was working with that whole situation with with uh, Joyce Fenderella Irby, mm -hmm. who had you know got the band signed. And I went over to the moms right, 
you know, during an admission, I was like, you know what, well, I'm a roadie. Like, I see a band moving their own stuff. It's like, they shouldn't be doing that. They signed to a major label. Like, y'all need some roadies. And she looked at me like I was crazy, and she called the drummer over William Burke. My my uncle William Burke dang, dang. called 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 him over and said, "Listen, deal with this dude. You know what I'm saying? Deal with this dude." So I'm, you know, sit telling Will, "Yeah, I could do this. I could do that." And Will was Will gave me the shot. Mm. Will was like, "All right, you say you could do all that. You do it." And, you know, I put together a road crew for them, mm. um, which, which were interns for my school. I put up a sign say, "Yo, you know, moving equipment for MCA recording artists, Princess of Star Breeze. It's gonna be lonely." You know, so I started doing stuff for the band, mm. and the band was always practicing at the mom's house, mm. and that's where Dallas was too. You know, so that's how I was able to build a relationship with Dallas Austin. Right. You know what I'm saying? I was one. Dallas was a big fan of um, of uh, Teddy Riley. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so when I knew that I, one of my bands, I had a guitar from a red guitar, red Korg mm. guitar. I, I bought it over and gave it to Dallas. Say, yo, here you go. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I had no idea that he was going to blow up and do the things he was doing. I just knew that he was passionate about doing music. Right. You know, so I gave him uh, his first core guitar type thing and uh, stole it from a band, you know. Which, I never knew that's what that <laughs> instrument was called. It's I called, called a guitar. the thing the Prince used to play. Right. A guitar. A guitar. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we, uh, we, we, that's how I got, so that's how I got to know Dallas and, um, then I, I, I was, at the time I was managing Arrested Development. Arrested yeah, Development I was about I, to bring that up too. Yeah, they they were first known. I started with Arrested Development when they were known as um, Ninety Miles Per Hour. No, mm -mm, no, that's Divine and Ninety Miles Per Hour. Yeah, yeah, it's Divine. Yeah, you're right, you're right. But they had a song called uh, Speed Limit Fifty Five. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. That's um, what I was trying to think of. Right, <laughs> right, right. Um, and uh, so I was, I was. What was the name of the group? Good, gosh darn it. I always noticed. Anyway, I was managing him under a different entity when speech was going through his public enemy phase. Mm -hmm. hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, you know, he had the pee on his head and everything like that. He was from Milwaukee and headliner was in a group and another guy. Um, and then uh, speech's grandmother and brother died very close to each other. Mm -hmm. And he went home to Milwaukee and he had this spiritual awakening and came up with Arrested Development, came back and, and told us, and, and at this time, we were all roommates. Mm -hmm. We were sharing a condo together. And that's where we recorded a lot of the the first album. We, we recorded uh, Fishing for Religion there, Mr. Window, we recorded there, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And um, so I had taken the band as far as I could take them. Mm -hmm. Got him some local shows and stuff like that. Got him some local recognition. Even wrote, directed, and starred in a little uh, TV, th a little movie thing that I never got a chance to finish. Um, uh, but I posted a lot of the clips on Instagram not too long ago uh, about it was called a, it was called a day in the life of. And if you remember that the, the name of the first album is three, three years, years, some days, and six mm -hmm. months in the life of, and. Um, the name of my film was called A Day in the Life of, and uh, you know, I had taken him as far as I could take him, and I, I called Michael Malden. Mm -hmm. I was doing a concert. Uh, it was a relief concert for a hurricane that had hit. And um, I was like, uh, I want to do this concert, and I want to book Soak Times Leather, right? And another band called Finest Hour, and I wanted Arrested Development along with uh, some other bands to open up because I wanted Michael Malden to see, see the it. act. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, Michael Molden, of course, is Jermaine's father. Right. And uh, so he came, uh, saw the band, liked them, took them, got them signed to EMI Chrysalis, Chrysalis mm -hmm. EMI, and the rest is history. Wow, that's crazy. But all this is doing the same time now. I want to go, this is what, 90? This is in like 89, 90. 90 right? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. And remember, like, L.A. and Face came here in 1988, the Jack the Rapper. They were promoting Karen White's new album. They right. Were doing, they were showcasing Karen White's new album. And that's when they decided to move their operation here to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So it was all coming together. It was all Same bubbling. Time. We never yeah. knew. We, yeah. we we didn't know. Right. It was all bubbling. Had no man. idea. No idea that this was going to happen. And then, you know, later, you know, Jermaine gets this thing with Michael Bivens does another bad creation, and later does Boys to Men. No, that was Dallas. Oh, that's Dallas. What you I said, say? you said Jermaine. Oh, my bad. That was <laughs> yeah, Dallas Austin. Right. My bad. I apologize. Um, and 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 that you know started percolating. Then, what happened was what really threw me in the limelight mm -hmm. was 
I was working with Jermaine, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I had this this group that I was developing through the same techniques that I learned from this movie that I told you about, The Automaker. I right. was going to sh- shops, stores, going through fan magazines. At that time, New Edition was hot, so their breakout situations was hot. Mm-hmm. Bell Biv DeVoe was my favorite group. Mm-hmm. My you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they, they, the way they blended the, the hip-hop and R&B was right. like crazy. crazy. And I was like, if they ever do a female group like this, it's going to be sick. Mm-hmm. I said, I need to, to, to work on that. Right. So I already had a young lady, Crystal Jones. Right. You know, she was a little tomboy. She was exactly what I was looking for. So, you know, I put the word out. I had auditioned a few other people. I put the word out, um, and I talked to Rico Wade, who, once again, this is pre-organized noise. This is the You Boys. Right. When they were dancers. They were dancers. Right. <laughs> they were dancers. <laughs> Marquez Etheridge, <laughs> Sleepy Brown, Rico Wade, Moan <laughs> Campbell, and Troy Gordon. They was dancers. You know, they were dancers. You know what I'm saying? And um, dancer was popping in the day. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they were doing their thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I talked to, to I told uh, Rico what I was looking for, and he went out and 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 found me. Uh, long story short, because I, I don't want to drag it out, he found me Tian and Lisa, mm-hmm. and um, I put them in the group. They were perfect, you know. Um, well, Lisa wasn't as perfect. She almost didn't make the group. But when I heard her rap, you know what I'm saying? I was like, okay, yeah, you know, you sound like Moni Love. I love Moni Love. I want to get you up in here too. Right. And then all I had to do, I, I tell everybody this: the moment I saw T, I knew right away. I was like, "Yo, you don't even have to sing for me." You know what I'm saying? She was a star, right? Straight up, straight up. And I went to her house at two o'clock in the morning, hmm. rang her doorbell. She come in the door, wiping the sleep out of her eyes. I was just like, "You are so freaking beautiful." You know what I'm saying? And it's like you, you you got this little tomboy thing. You weren't trying to be sexy. You were sexy without exuding sex appeal. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, yeah, you got to be in this situation. So I, I got them all together and called them Second Nature. Mm-hmm. You know, so I took Second Nature to Jermaine Dupri. Right. And at this time, he was developing some kids he found in a mall. Right. They were called A Little Funk. Hmm. All right. Now, there's, a, there's the deeper back of story to this, but, you know, I am not going to go into it right, right. now. I'm just right. not going to go into it. You know what I'm saying? But there's definitely a back story, story in that whole situation. Um, so he's producing these kids, um, and he loved the package that I put together for Second Nature. And he's like, yo, if you can get me a photo shoot like this, you know, um, I'll produce your group. And I said, deal. So I went and did Criss Cross's first group, the, the Little Funk, and then they changed their name That's to Criss Cross. So... That year, 1991, Mm -hmm. all right, Arrested Development, Mm -hmm. Crisscross, Second Nature, now known as TLC, they all dropped singles. That was all the same year? Same year. Damn. Same year. Tennessee, um, Ain't Too Proud to Beg, and Jump all came out in um, 1991. Damn. And all the albums went multi-platinum. All of the acts were nominated for Grammys, right. and Arrested Development won two that year. Right. So people knew me from walking around with TLC, with, with Second Nature, with TLC. They knew me from that. They knew I was managing mm-hmm. Arrested Development, and somehow they didn't know they didn't know what I was doing, but I was working with Jermaine Dupri and Crisscross. Mm-hmm. So it was like, okay, well, this guy's got the magic touch. Yeah, yeah. Three for three, <laughs> right. baby. Three for three. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was just fortunate circumstances. You know right. what I'm saying? That, that's all it was. Right. Um, being in the right place at the, the right, right time. time. And, and you know, pushing myself out there to make sure that I was valuable to these people. Mm-hmm. See, that's the key. I think we can't gloss over that because what I'm listening to you, you all, you kept creating situations for yourself to make sure yes. that you were being around. Yes. Like even I work for free. I'll be a roadie. I don't care. I just want to be out here. Absolutely. That work ethic is everything, man. I mean, it's it's, it's what got me to this place in my life right now. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Just 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 do it. Like, because it ain't all about the money all the time. No, it's not. Right. Yeah. It's not. You know, because now I can look back. You know, mm-hmm. when I look back upon my accomplishments, you know. You know, and um, Barry Gordy is a hero of mine, but I, I created one of the biggest selling female groups of all times. Correct. Of all times. Who can say that? Yeah. You, really? You can. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Ian now, Burke can say that. I'm not taking anything away from Pebbles, right. you know, because Pebbles had the connections. She got them the record deal. She got them out there. Right. 
But I'm the one who put put the cake together. She took that money. So <laughs> let me ask you this: When we, I, when I said it, he ain't said. <laughs> so let me ask you this: Even when we talk about, and I, I I know when you developed the group Second Nation, I, I also know Crystal as well. When they portrayed Crystal, do you think that her, her portrayal no was was unjust? Yeah, I do. I do. I I you know, I I wasn't there for that audition. I do know mm-hmm. that you know she was acting. She wasn't acting like a star. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Right. She was like, you know, as it was brought to me years ago, uh, I don't know what to sing. Somebody tells you to sing, and you, you and you, you, oh, what should I sing? You got to drop everything. You got to do that. And you got to do it. Right. Like, you're in front of L.A. Reed and Babyface, or just L.A. Reed and Pebbles. Right. You know what I'm saying? This is no time for you to to to, to get, and, and she's been in front of crowds before. She was a right. background dancer right. for some acts and stuff like that. It's not like she was a newbie to this. Right. You know what I'm saying? So um, I, when I heard, when I saw the movie, and they, they had the girl singing kind of twisted, and I was like, nah, you know, I, it wasn't like that. It wasn't. Right. It wasn't that bad, right. you know. So, I think that she was kind of unfairly. But I think they did that. Was that for entertainment? Entertainment purposes, purposes yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, when I looked at, it, I just I, I, that's what I thought. I was like, it was done for entertainment purposes. Mm-hmm. But moving from there, you also like, you was doing so much during that time. Like even with, you know, you had ASCAP going. Like, how did you get into the whole ASCAP situation? ASCAP came much later, um, in the nineties. I think in nineteen ninety eight. That was like after 96, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. That was, um, you know, I, because I had done so much, you mm-hmm. know. So in between time, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I want to go too. I don't want to go that far, but I want to stay like where we were. It was like right, 91, right 92. Yeah. Because a lot happened. A lot happened. In that time right there. You know, um, at that time, like when when uh, the, the band started getting right, right around the time when I was with Too Crazy and we mm-hmm. were doing it, I was living with Lisa. You know what I'm saying? Right. Lisa and I, you know, had forged this friendship. You know, she had um, discovered Jamal, and I had Jamal or Molly Ma or Molly G. Molly G. Yeah. Yeah. I was the one taking care of him. I had to get him enrolled in school. <laughs> his blood is bad. Bad ass. Oh, right. my, oh God. my God. Molly was bad. Everybody, that's the first thing they say about him every time they bring his name up. Dude, he was a little kid, but, but he was talented, though. Yep. Right. And he still is. Was, he, yeah, he still is. He could write rhymes. He was doing art and stuff. He was a t- he was just bad as. <laughs> then they put him on here. Okay, then, cool. then they put him with another kid that was bad from the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> Chocolate but me- dude, yeah. <laughs> so you had these two gangster ass kids. You know what I'm saying? So, um, so I was staying with Lisa for a while. That's illegal for y'all who don't know who. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's illegal. I was staying with Lisa for a while. Um, then, you know, I went and was staying with a, another friend of mine, uh, mm-hmm. Tasha White, mm-hmm. and her her husband now, but it was her boyfriend at that time, uh, Kevin. Um, and, um, you know, while I was staying with them, I was driving my car, I was headed over to the dungeon, and I got pulled over and locked up for no proof of insurance <laughs> and driving without with a suspended driver's <laughs> license. Some I bullshit. got locked up. Yeah. Was you a cop? No, nah, man, I was <laughs> off for one sixty six. Okay, that's not some cop shit. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they like I got caught in a road trap. Uh, yeah, right off the that's freeway. That's when they used to do that. Yeah, 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 they used to do that all the time. Those are undefeated too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the next day, my boy Quan Prather got me out of jail. Mm, KP, KP got me out of jail. Took me straight over to the dungeon, and was and 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 Rico was like, "Yeah, you gonna stay here." And you gonna manage us. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it was like, you know, we know what you could do. We're gonna give you the opportunity to do it. And right. that's how I ended up over at the dungeon. Right. That's you know, so So we, around, so let's let's talk about the dungeon. Let's talk about the whole dungeon family. Mm-hmm. Um we first talked about them earlier when we talked about the U Boys. How did that whole dungeon family thing form out of that whole dancing thing? Um, they connected, uh I, I don't know if it was Pat. Sleepy or Rico first connected with Ray, Ray Murray, mm-hmm. um, who was just just dope ass producer, just real quiet dude, was great at production. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, you know, they became this production trio mm-hmm. called Organized Noise. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And they they made their base camp in uh, Rico's mom's house. Okay. And that that became the dungeon. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So they were starting to do some production work. Um, for a moment, I was working with Pebbles. 
um, and Sleepy was their producer, mm -hmm. was her producer. So I would drive Sleepy back and forth from home to the studio. And um, that's how I got a chance to, to meet, for the first time, L.A. Reid, because they were in the studio working on the Boomerang soundtrack. I was there. Wow. It was like L.A. Reid, Babyface, Daryl Simmons, and K.O., mm -hmm. right? They working on the, so, but I, you know, I was, I was just the driver. So I had to sit in the room and, and Sleepy was teasing me. It was like, yo, L.A. came in the back in the little, cause we were at Doppler Studios. L.A. came in the back in the little snack area and, and uh, Sleepy was teasing me and said, yo, he didn't want to come in the studio, he didn't want to come in the studio. So L.A. looked at me and was like, you want to come in? I was like, yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I said, come on. And I went back there and I'm sitting there, I'm like, yo, dude, I'm in the studio with L.A. Reid, Babyface, Daryl, and Kale. This is the deal. You understand what I'm saying? Two occasions. Yes. You know what I'm Night. saying? Night. Night. You know Day. what I'm saying? So, and they're creating this song that was originally, I believe, for Anita Baker, but ended up going on Tony Braxton. Um, it was the up-tempo record from um, uh, Boomerang, and I will love you forever. And that will stick in my mind because... Uh, Daryl Simmons was singing that hook at the top of his lungs all throughout the studio, just walking around singing it, you know, and I'm just sitting there like, like, oh man, you know, like I had died and gone to heaven. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Baby, LA and Babyface, all of these hit records, Paula Abdul, Bobby Brown, Pebbles, you know, they were solid hit makers and I was in the studio with them. Yeah. So it was a, an amazing moment for me. You got, and I think a lot of people, like even for us, when we first seen these people, these was these were stars to us. Right, right. Like you got to understand, these are what we still consider stars. Mm -hmm. And this like, before social media, so you don't yeah, get to no, be around no, these. No, no exactly. You don't see them. Mm -mm. Right. So to be in the studio with an LA and a face back in they in they heyday, this yeah. was their like during the boomerang soundtrack. Right. Yeah. yeah. But this is when they had like four or five top records on the radio at the time. Right. You right. Know what I'm saying they were they were the, the they were definitely doing the thing. And um, I was sitting in the studio with these hit makers. You know what I'm saying? And they just weren't urban hit makers. They were pop hit makers. Right, right. So yeah. when we so when we talk about those times and we and we look, we fast forward to now, right? How much has changed from then to now? You know what I'm saying? Man, you know, you still have these these great producers. Um and I'm trying to think of at least one of them. Booming, booming, Metro Booming. Metro Booming. Yeah. Um, Sunny Digital. Mm -hmm. um, what's Future's producer? Uh, Zaytoven. Zaytoven. Right. Um, you know, but they, they're not the they. They. And I don't want to say cookie cutter. Right. I don't want to say that. But they 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 didn't really distinguish themselves like like a L.A. and Babyface. You think it's the technology? It's, it could be. It's it's so easy right now. These yeah. people, these producers played instruments. Right. They, in order for them to make these hit records, they had to be able to play the instrument. Right. Now you could just go up in there and you program a drum or whatever, and you're a producer. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I it, it's just different. So when you so what you really want to say is they don't really have a distinguished sound like a lot of the producers prior to them like yeah, when, you, when, you, when you when we go back we talk about teddy riley right he had new jack swing yes you had la and face they had their own sound you go back you had jimmy jimmy Tam jim terry lewis. lewis yeah you see what i'm saying and then when you start going up you had dallas who had a sound then you yep. had jermaine who had a sound then you had hip-hop producers who had their own sound now when you think about music now who has a who has their own signature sound now i can't name one person that i can sit back and say that's a so and so beat. Yeah, you still got to go back. It's like yeah. Timberland, the Neptune. Exactly. Those Even guys. organized noise. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, okay, yeah, that 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 that's the mixture of 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 all the collective elements of organized noise. So, no, and once again, no disrespect. I'm now not trying to diss anybody. Yeah. Right. Like everybody's out We're there. They're making honest. money. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They're right. doing their thing. They're making hit records. That's all that matters. Right. Mm -hmm. But for me, you know, an OG up in this thing. You know, it's just not the same. Right. It's not the same. Now, let me ask you this, too. Do you think, and you're a producer, so do you think, I, I always wonder if it was because back in the day it was more collaboration. Like, y'all don't just say L.A. You say L.A., Babyface, such and such was in the room. Organized Noise is a group of dope-ass niggas. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of these producers, it just be them. 
like and, one and, guy. And and that you know that was if you really think about it, that a lot of that was going on. Whether you talking about L.A. Babyface, um, Gamble and Huff, you're mm-hmm. talking about Jimmy Jam, and Jimmy Terry Jam, and Terry Lewis. You're talking about Holland Dozier, Holland. Right. You're talking about Ashford and Simpson. Right. You understand what I'm Teams. saying? There was, there was, there was, there was always strength in numbers with them. To me, in my brain, it's the first thing I think of is why I think a lot of these guys, it's not as big mm-hmm. because, I mean, collaboration is the key to everything. Absolutely. And don't think like Jermaine had strong collaboration. Oh yeah. Jalen, Jonte Austin, Brian Michael Cox. You what, know what, what I'm my saying? My man that was over there first, Manuel. Uh, Manuel Seal. Yeah, that's, yep. he was over there. He early was the on. first one. Right. Yeah, he did all the hits on um, on Escape. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I would. That's how I met Manny. Manny was in in his second house, hmm. his first big house. Um, I met Manny over there while while we right. were working on the first Escape album. So even when you think about it now, like, and I gotta ask you this: How do you feel about the industry now? That when, what we just talked about, you just talked about groups. Mm-hmm. You talked about uh, Arrested Development. You talked about Illegal. We talked about TLC. We talked about Organized Noise. Mm-hmm. Everything we talked about was a collective of something. Mm-hmm. Now we're moving in an industry now where there are no groups. Yeah. How do you feel about that now? I, you know what? I and and. I'm disappointed and sad at the at the same time. Uh, well, disappointed and I, 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 like we we talking about a we talking about a industry. Well, we talking about at, since the fifties, right? If not even before, there have always been some form some of a sort group. of group out there. Yeah, you see but what I'm these, these people can't get along long enough. Their egos won't allow them to get along long enough. To, to create something that could be wonderful. Like, you know, and I'm I'm on a constant look always. Mm-hmm. Yeah, group. you love groups. So. I love groups. Yeah, absolutely. You but, know what I'm saying? But do you think it was like, at one point I heard, like, a lot of it was the labels. The labels didn't want to pay for moving parts. Like, right, That that's some of it. But you get them the right moving part, a label will definitely make that happen. Mm-hmm. But it has to be something that's making hits. Right. You understand what I'm saying? It has to be something that people are buying into. So, so you don't think, you don't... Like even we th- when we talk about a Destiny Child, let's let's think about even from what came out of Destiny Child. You right. have three solo artists that came out of one group. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? So when we think about that, you don't think we could, could we could put another group together that could be just as successful? Absolutely, as- I feel like we can. Puff keep trying it. <laughs> just- I feel like but we that's, can. But that's the point I keep saying. Like everybody is trying it. Yeah. You, I look at you as like the the guru of the group. Mm. What do you think it would take right now? to make that work. And it has to be a, a group of p- individuals, male or female, that are willing to listen to what's going on. The thing that, that that I know that helped make TLC so successful is that they listened to Pebbles. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? They listened to the direction, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying, that Dallas gave them. They, they were receptive to it. Right. There wasn't no, I got 800,000 followers. You can't tell me what to do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. It wasn't all of that. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know. Um, so, yeah, I think that social media definitely have, plays a part in this, the egotistical way that some of these artists think and feel. Right. You know what I'm saying? So um, we didn't have that back in the day. So, right. you know, these, these people were more uh, acceptive to right. one another. Well, and they was willing to learn. They were willing to learn. Yeah. I think now there's so much information out there now. When we came up, it wasn't, it was kind of trial and error. Yeah. Now I think it's, I read about that. I heard about that. I seen that. And I ain't going for that. And see, and this is the thing, X, we, we came up, we had to learn from our own, but we didn't have no mentors. There was no right. industry here. Right. We had to learn on our oh, own. Correct. You know, these people have access to so many different mentors between yourself and what you do with the coalition DJs. Right. Filthy, what, what what you guys do as a collective, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And and people willing to show them the way. You mm-hmm. know, they also have reading material. We couldn't Google nothing when we were coming up. And they got business. YouTube University. They got YouTube University <laughs> where everybody is on there talking about their experiences in the game. Right. You know, not only that. Every streaming network has a, a documentary on Clive Davis, 
uh, uh, Clarence Avon, Quincy Jones, Dave Foster. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You can learn a lot from the things that they went through and how they discovered talent, right. you know, and what they looked for in talent if you just sit back and pay attention. Mm. But once again, they, the people, don't, they think they know it all. So uh, let me ask this real quick because you just made me think about that. When you, because I was on the phone the other day with Nick Love and we was having this conversation and I said, man, like, I wonder, is it a new Nick Love? Is it a new X? Is is it a new Ian Burke? Is it a new the behind the scenes people here in Atlanta? Because you in Atlanta right now, it's the same people mm -hmm. that, are, that are trying to push the needle forward to where I heard one of the young guys say, well, y'all old cats need to get out of the way. <laughs> but in my mind, I go, if we get out of the way, what do you guys really have? Right. So when I ask, I have to ask you this, Going back to old Atlanta to now, what do you see that we what needs to happen for us to get back into a place to where we are producing the level of talent that we was p producing before? I do know what honestly, X. I don't know if we can. It's just a different way. It's a different way of doing things right now. Right. You know, there are a few people that will listen. Uh, a few people that 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 will you know work on following. The, right. the trends of the past, but it, it's not enough of us. Right. You know, we have to continue doing the things, your, your, your summit that right. you do every January. We have to continue to, to reach out to these young folks that are coming up in the game right. and showing them the way. And, and hopefully some of the ones, because I, I don't see it either. I don't see the new Nick Love. I definitely don't see the new X. Right. You know what I'm saying? I don't see any of these people walking around doing certain things, you right. know? Um, I have some people working alongside of me that are willing to learn. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm still keeping my eye out, you know, making <laughs> right. sure that, you know, this is what they really yeah, want to do, that they, they're, they're learning the real way, you know, but it, there's not enough people. And there, there's definitely some artists out there. Like, you know, you know my favorite, you know my trip. They still, <laughs> yeah. There's only a much, there's just a more matter of time yeah. before they blow. Just right. a matter of time. You showcase yeah. them on, on the yeah. stage here. Y'all check out Mind Trip. It's a brother and a sister. They go crazy. Look them up. Yeah. But, they, they, they're going to, as a production team. Everything. Mm -hmm. And an artist, they are amazing. They are the new Missy and Timbaland. Right. But what I'm saying, like, when we talk about Atlanta, Atlanta has always, like, just from what you just talked about, mm -hmm. somebody has always been there pushing, pushing, pushing even from like we see the success of qc we see the success of all the new cast that's coming now we got this wave of like now it's like a stalemate in atlanta nothing is coming out of the city right is it politics or is it just the times i just think we're caught in a rut man we're in the dark ages right we're about to emerge though i, I truly believe that we'll we will emerge victorious right. okay you know what I'm saying? Some people feel like, okay, Atlanta has had, has, has had its time. Right. I think a, a lot of energy and effort is being put into the film and television market now right. here in Atlanta. But I just feel like we're, we're just waiting for a new resurgence to come around. I don't think that Atlanta's done. No, I, I, think don't we even, have, I don't think that at all. Yeah, I think we have a whole lot more I, to offer. Like I was just telling them earlier when we was talking, I think Atlanta's in, you know, we've had an era. Yeah. And I think now we're beginning a new era, and now Atlanta has to figure out how we fit into the new era. Mm -hmm. Just like you said, everything is changing. Right. So when everything is changing, we can't think that we're going to continue to keep doing what we're doing right. and never have to change. Right. So I think that the change has to happen, but in us making this change, where do you see the music going? That's a good question. Um, that's a real good question. And I ask that question all the time because when you think about past talent, we come from Outkast to Future to Migos to TLC to just the, just the list goes on and on out of the city. Mm -hmm. Where do we go from here? Uh, I, I, I'd, I'd love to see the resurgence, and this is talking about groups and stuff like that. I'd love to see the resurgence of live music come back and, and play a part yeah. in what we're doing. There's a band here in town called Hero the Band. Okay. You know what I'm saying? They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're doing their thing. Right. Um, you know, we went through a, revolu a, a revolution here with black rock musicians. Right. Back in the 90s. Yeah. You know, we had Mobius Trip. We had Wild Peach. We mm -hmm. had Edith Swish. Right. You know what I'm saying? Where where these these young people, African American people, were playing instruments on stage and entertaining right. us with with real music. Mm -hmm. but you you can't know, beat that. 
No, I mean you you can't. And I think that I think that that is going to. I don't know how. I don't know who. Right. But I think that somebody's going to come in and catch somebody off guard, and and everybody's going to fall in love. Yeah. With what they have to offer. Well, my theory has always been this: I always say hit them where where it's always a, a hole. You mm-hmm. get what I'm saying? Like right. if it's a hole there, go and fill that hole. Like a lot of the problems I see, everybody want everybody want to be a solo artist. Mm-hmm. Everybody want to be the center of attention. Right. But you know this, and I know this to be true. If you go and partner with somebody and become a group, and there's no there's an open hole, and there's nobody there for a group, the likelihood of you getting signed mm-hmm. is what. A uh, 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 <laughs> uh, a better percentage than not, <laughs> you know. And it's funny though, cause I go on, I I watch all of these these kids right playing instruments, man. Mm-hmm. And I was like, boy, if I just had, I would recruit these young kids playing instruments, put together a young band, right, and just blow everybody's mind. You know what I'm saying? You watch on on Instagram, Instagram reels. I'm just scrolling through and see and, little and, white girls. Do, 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 do. Every, and the kids are playing instruments. Again. They're playing instruments. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and nobody's looking at that. I'm like, you know, one day I'm gonna have enough money to reach out to some of these people and put together my own little situation, yeah. and I'm gonna put it out there. Yeah, but I think bands are coming back. I think the whole bands, the R&B, the whole musical aspect of instrumentation is is coming back. I mm-hmm. just think because, and this is me being a producer. This is the producer X. I just think for from a music standpoint, it's been such a straightforward everybody has the same sound everybody uses the same sounds mm-hmm. everybody uses the same song structure everybody does the same identical thing in the studio like when you listen to the radio now every rap record sounds the same mm-hmm. there's nothing distinguishable about each song in the, uh, now you get what i'm saying it's, it's like it's cookie cutter i was here for monday there was a couple of acts for new music monday it sounded they they did three songs and the song sounded like Same it never song ended. Three times. <laughs> Same song three times. There was a couple of acts on here that did that X. Couple of acts. I sat there was like, yo, that was just one long song. Yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying? No tonal change, no bridges, no hooks, no just straight. Next record. And I'm just like, wow, man. Like, and you know, everybody's being politically correct. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just like, told us to start being nice because we used to flame their ass. Yeah, but see, but but that's see, that's the one thing about New Music Monday. I don't want to kill their dream. Right, I, I just right. want them to get I better. Do <laughs> I just want them to get better. So it's you know. a good thing. X. I was like, I said, X. Please don't, don't, don't call on me, man. Don't call on me. <laughs> These people, there's no artist development, Rich. Okay. These people catching, you know, they're up here performing and 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 and, and you know, not catching, not being able to breathe. Can't even hold the mic right. Can't hold the mic right. They had a little redhead girl, you know, who could have been cool, but she was doing the same thing, and she just twiddling around stage trying to be cute and I'm just like baby you are not entertaining so you guys are answering the question I don't even know if y'all are listening to yourselves so listen to the groups that you were naming right in the time of the music industry I remember there was artist development camps yeah like I remember a nigga took me to some dude and he had me doing push-ups and running and jogging while rapping yeah. songs and shit like yeah. to practice to be on stage that doesn't exist anymore. No. So I think a part of the problem why people ain't blowing up and, and talented people because there is no artist of development. The only artist development they have is coming to New Music Monday and us telling them, hey, bro, hold the mic, breathe like this. Mm-hmm. And that's only like 30 seconds, but that's not a real development of an artist. No, it's not. It's not. And and I think the music is suffering right. because of that. The the art is suffering because of that. And once again, I I, th- I got 800,000 followers. I don't need to do all that. Yep. I just need a hot record, and I'm going to put the content on my social media, and I'm going to take off. But most of them don't even promote on their social media. <laughs> yeah, but, but then how do you argue with an artist who it ends up working for? You know what I'm saying? I, you know, and then, you know, Ice Spice. I, I, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, explain that to me. I, 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 <laughs> I'm not being mean. I'm just being honest. You're a Listen, professional, I, so I, I got to ask you. I, I can't explain that. I, I don't even know where this girl came from. And once again, I'm not going to knock her hustle. I'm right. not going to knock what she do. She had right. a basketball t- player allegedly go out and spend $500,000 on her. So... Power to your people. Right. You know what I'm saying? Power to her pee hole. Shit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> stop, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. That's some expensive <laughs> pee. Man, listen, bro. I don't want it. Uh, listen, I, 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 
ask, I can't answer that question. I, I, all of the people just start to, Ice Spice. Who is Ice Spice? And I see these red homie the clown type <laughs> thing going on here. And I'm not, you know, no dis, once again, no disrespect. She's an attractive young lady. Yeah. You know, is that, that's who I thought of when I saw, so, saw, saw her, her, her images and stuff like that. But, you know, she's doing her thing. So do you believe in industry plants? They they have this term. They be like, "Yo, these people aren't really like the powers that be are planning artists in the game to influence people, and that's why they come out." Well, and that's why he's making the, the statement he's making because when you look at it, he's asking you, "Where did where she they come, come from? from?" Right? Yeah, that's why I asked that. What? Where? Where did? She, and that? And that's all. That's because when you actually think about it, and let's talk about it for real. When we when we when we talk about an artist that would actually garner the type of attention that she's getting right now, she's that artist normally is. Three, four hit records in. Mm -hmm. Like the kind of attention that she's getting right now. Right. We're talking about an artist that's got at least two, three records that's done well. On the charts. Right. She's charting. Yeah, big time. So, you know, you can't argue with it, but once again, where did she come from? I don't know. Yeah, I believe in industry planning. Yeah, they do. But, but, but do you, but, but an industry professional will argue that the numbers are there. Yeah, I mean, you push something down somebody's throat long and hard enough. Right. You know what I'm saying? And people can always fudge numbers. <laughs> Trust and believe. Trust and believe. Like, there you know you what I'm saying? They, they, and these kids don't know any better. <laughs> these kids, you know, they, they some of these people don't even know who Stevie Wonder is. Right. Ooh. Oh, well, let me go back. That's because the parents' we had, fault. We just did it. Hold up. But we Blame did your it. parents. But we did a show the other week, and what my boy say, the he best said, rapper... Niggas wasn't rapping until Lil Wayne started. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> so there was never no LL Cool J, no Rakim, no like, Red Man. These were his exact words. Niggas wasn't spin bars. That's what it was, until Lil Wayne. Wow. So, so you going to put Lil Wayne up against Rakim? Oh, he See, made a face when I said uh, that. Man, we say that. That's like going too far back. That's like yeah. super old school. That's like busy B old. So then I brought it current. I said, okay, well, Hove. Hove was before Wayne. That's yeah, exactly. Jay-Z is Lil Wayne's favorite rapper. We could talk Tupac. Right. Biggie. But, but he, we could go on for days. Yeah, it, we sure can. Bars. But when we talk three about stacks? The, but when we talk about the younger culture, though, Ian, and I have to ask you this because we both come from that, from that same era. Do you think it was our responsibility to teach this history or to teach this stuff to these kids so that they do know? No, it's not our responsibility. I think that when I grew up in my household there you go, in Mount Vernon, I, I had a well-rounded... I was listening to... Um, my father had me listening to Chet Atkins, Fats Domino, Louis Armstrong, right? Right. My mom had me listening to uh, 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 Harry Belafonte, and um, what's the Indian singer that was for Johnny Mathis? Right. You understand what I'm saying? My sisters had me listening to the Motown sound. Right. Diana Ross and the Supremes. Right. The Temptations. Right. The Commodores. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Michael Jackson and the Jackson 5. Correct. My baby sister had me listening to Kenny Loggins, mm. Kenny Rogers, right? Top 40. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Hall of Notes. Hall of Notes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's a lot of diversity. That is diversity for, oh, and I forgot, my brother who was in the military, in the Navy, had me listening to Elton John, right. Chicago, right. the Eagles. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? I got such a well-rounded, people hate, the, these young folks hate driving in the car with me. Right. Because I'm sitting up there blasting Elton John. You know right. what I'm saying? And they and, would un they would they could never understand why you would like Elton John. And they and you know what Escape used to hate that when they used to ride around with me and be like, "What the hell are you listening to?" Rocket Man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so so that okay so again again that's the answer right? I feel like Sundays you know when your mom was cleaning the house there was the music. The in music the house. was permeating through the house. Yeah. The I, only one that she wouldn't let me listen to was Prince. They. Wow. Yeah. Oh, but no. Prince, she Prince freaky, though, man. Prince was the freak. My yeah. mom went and bought me the Prince album. <laughs> you know what I'm but again, so the reason that y'all think I'm joking, but I say, oh, you got to blame the parents because no, it's like. No, that's true, though. What is being heard in the house? A right. lot of these parents is so young, they listening to the same shit their kids are listening, so listening the, to. The parents is listening to Future in the house. So the parents listen to Lil Wayne, so they might think, damn, Lil Wayne really was the first thing. But. I know in my house, my kids, listen, man, I'm like that. I play everything. I purposely play but my... But you know what, what, what's crazy, real quick? I'm looking at these little white girls on the bass playing Funkadelic. 
yeah. and stuff like that. These yeah. little little doom, 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 but they know how. To, but they was taught the music because their parents listened to it. Yep, it had to come from the parents. You uh, exactly. Saying? Yes, absolutely. Well, where when you look at our parents, you know, Funkadelic is oh, that's old folks' music. Oh, uh, uh, they only know the hits. Mm-hmm. You get what I'm saying? Those kids know the songs that wasn't the hits. That right. was the B side. Yep. You know what I'm saying? The un- the songs that you know if you were a fan of that person, you know, you know, you know, the, the, song. You know the song. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So what about this then? Another thing, I feel like musicians and those type of artists that were big that we love really, really love music. A lot of this shit for artists is a lick now. Like, they're not even artists for real. Like, man, it's just a hustle. I'm just trying to get out the hood, man. Let me go ahead and rap some shit and just try to feed my family. They don't really care about the art. I, I, it's had, very apparent. I, I had a group of... What do you call them? Uh, social media folks, influencers, influencers, mm-hmm. right? Who were making money on YouTube, right? Because of all the little skits that they were filming, right? They decided, well, hey, let's just make a record. We got people paying attention mm-hmm. to us. Let's make a record. And of course, people started chiming into the mm-hmm. stuff that they were doing. They weren't serious to them. They were, it was a lick, just like you said. Right. It was a lick. They weren't serious about it, you know. Because when I tried to approach them on that. You know what I'm saying? Say, hey, you know, let, let's use this. To, well, we're not really serious about the, the music. But, we, you know, how can we get more into the whole, uh, uh, you know, more skits and stuff like that, more, more of being an influencer? I was just like, wow. So, listen, and, this, and it's glad, I'm glad we're talking about that because I want to go back to when we were talking about Atlanta and, like, how you got started and, mm-hmm. and, and the opportunity, right? When you look at now opposed to back then and you look at how kids come into the game, when we came in, we actually had to put in a lot of work. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Now you can kind of come in and kind of get up under somebody and kind of get in that way. We And, and then these kids kind of expect to be paid <laughs> without really putting in no work. Mm-hmm. When I'm asking you who, who's that in the beginning with me, how long was it before you got your real, your first real check? How much work did you put in before you got that real check? Yo, I worked from 85 <laughs> all the way to 1991. My real check came from Ichiban Records. Oh, done. <laughs> you know, that's how long it took me yeah. to get every, you know, I get a couple of dollars. I got some gas money sometimes, you know, but it wasn't until 1991 that I got my first real check in this music business. And that's when I started running the hip hop department over there at Ichiban. Right. right. Yeah. People forget about Ichiban. Talk about that for a second. Oh, man. You know, I, I was over there. I just Ichiban Records started a Vanilla Ice. They put out Ice Ice Baby Thank first. You. I told them that. Oh, they did. didn't want to believe me. I told that. you that. Yeah. Yep. That, it, that's that's the truth. They put out and then and then they did the deal with what was it? S, X, I think X C K S K something. But they had a deal with Interscope. I think that's when Interscope yeah, well, first and, just, and just started. Yeah. It, it was that that label uh, that the the Asian guys label, and then it went to Interscope. Right. right? Um, so they were like, yo, let me, let's start a hip hop department. So Michael Malden actually referred me for the job. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I, I always would say that it was payback for bringing him arrested development. And, um, so I went there, started working and I had the worst repertoire of music <laughs> <laughs> on, the hip-hop, push. on the hip hop side. Oh my God. Like, tell, I, tell us some of the artists y'all had. Yo, we had 40, what was it? <laughs> 45 something, 45. King? No, it was a, no, it was a group. I, I can't even remember the name. Four Five Posse or something well, like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. It was something crazy. Yeah. But they was, during that time, Ichiban was known for if you couldn't go get a deal anywhere else, you can go get a distribution deal through Ichiban. That's yeah, what they here, was known. Here in Atlanta, for. right? Yeah, yeah, here in Atlanta. Right. It, it was ran by uh, a German named Nina Easton and her husband, John Abbey, from England. Right. And um, uh, that's what it was, really. It was just a distribution. A distribution it's what, it's, it, it, it was what they call what they do now. But it was like you really could go to the office and it was right. unlike. We had real people in yeah. the office. <laughs> but right. it was the same thing as like now if you was go sign up for Tune Corps. Nobody else would put you out. You can go sign up for Tune Corps. Yeah. Done to put you out. And put you out. Okay. So when a lot of the Atlanta cats, when New York wouldn't sign us or wouldn't sign those acts, you know you could go get a deal like Ichiban. Mm-hmm. But just distribution, like no bread or nothing. No, no, not really. No, no bread. No, okay, no. just straight distribution. But now, if you sold some units, yeah, they would they would start pumping money behind you. Okay, yeah. okay, right. So, so right, we had there was a couple one one group right 
got the worst album cover of, from the source. It was like, <laughs> yo, this is the worst hip hop album cover ever. And the guys were in like look like diapers and were on four on all fours and had a couple of white women walking them. And and the, the, we were in the Source magazine, worst album oh. cover in hip hop That's ever. It. History. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and you know, I was a nobody. College radio would not take me. Do you know how, when you can't get college radio to take your phone they calls? Take right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> They'd be happy with. Well, I couldn't get nobody. And then then some of '91, the miracle happened. I got a record, and it it just re regenerated my career. The record was Ain't No Future in Your Front. The artist was MC Breed from Flint, Michigan. Yes, I am the one who broke that record. I didn't know that. Yes. Goddamn Ian. Yes. Yes. That Breed. was that Breed. I had people. Now they were all calling me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, yo, can we get Breed? Can we do this? And MC Breed? Blah, 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 blah. I was like, yeah, yeah slow because, down, slow down. Because I think like before Breed, people knew about Itchy Bun, but they didn't They believe, knew about us, yeah. They didn't really believe that Itchy Bun could do what they did with Breed. You had a nigga with a diaper on the but, yeah, yeah, but, you know, but, the music we put out. You, you got to remember, John was a, a guy from England. Yeah. And most of the groups that was prior to own Itchy Bun was like blues groups, gospel groups. That's what they were, um, jazz. You know what I'm saying? You like know, like we had, um, was, was a, I'd be, I'd be smoking. Well, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be uh, Clarence Carter. Clarence Carter. Carter. I'd be stroking. Stroking. Yeah, be stroking. <laughs> That's what I'd be doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had people like him. <laughs> okay. You that, know was what Itchy Bun that was Itchy Bun That was Itchy What's no, it? no, it was it was re-released on Itchy Bond. Right. He came, he came. He's on Malico a, at first. Yeah, okay. Yeah. He he came and did a, a distribution deal after his Malico days. Okay, yeah. So, but that was like when you when I had um who I had on the show. We was talking about old Atlanta. We had somebody. I think I had Tumpo, mm -hmm. and we was talking about old Atlanta and how Itchy Bond. Like when we had when John went through there and and like how that whole them being able to take those records to Itchy Bond kind of shape the Atlanta sound mm -hmm. because those records were being played locally when uh, when everybody else was playing mainstream hip, real hip. When they, everybody was playing Naughty by Nature, mm -hmm. we was playing MC Bree. We was playing the records that was on Itchy Bond. We was playing Smurf. We was playing Shy D. That's we was playing Raheem the Dream. You Success and Effect. Success and Effect. You know what I'm saying? That was the first. No, they was on Joy Boy. They yeah. was out of Florida. Yeah. Then they moved. And then to, they moved over here to Itchy yeah. Bond. Yep. No, my life. Nasty, nasty Mix <laughs> came and did a distribution deal with us. This was after um, uh, <clears throat> Sir Mix a lot left. Yeah, you know, but uh, the the label itself came and did a distribution deal. We had the Fat Boys. Yeah, they did have the Fat Boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I want to go back and talk about this real quick because I know we we ran out of time. Um, <laughs> we can go on forever. We're talking right. here forever, bro. Listen, <laughs> yeah. Atlanta Radio. I gotta mention this. Um, a lot of people don't remember it back in the early days of Atlanta because everybody always think Atlanta. Now we got four hip hop stations mm -hmm. in the city. At one point, it was no no hip hop, no hip hop, no on either station. Mm -hmm. um, one of the hubs we had was one of our homeboys, one of our personal homeboys, Tyler Shabazz. Yeah, uh, oh, uh, our I, W R A S eighty eight. Right. I couldn't I State. couldn't do this interview without mentioning it. Um, tell people how valuable that station was to Atlanta oh, hip hop during that. That, that. that is where I broke. A uh, uh, plays ball. Is this college radio? College radio. College radio. radio. College radio. So Georgia was, State. Georgia, Georgia State. State. Oh. They, they, W R A S eighty eight point nine, I think FM. Eighty eight point five. Eighty eight point five. Right. Um, Real they, they're a hundred thousand watt radio station, and Talib and Randall Moore, Talib Shabazz and Randall Moore had a, a hip hop show, a very popular hip hop show. Uh, um, and I would take the guys and the the music up there, play to play his ball, and they would they would rock that 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 music. And Talib had a a, a, a street company, a street team company too, called Keep It Street, mm -hmm. where they worked records and stuff like that. But it was Talib, Shabazz, Randall Moore. It was a subtlety DJ yeah, subtlety yeah, 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 on yeah. WREK, which was Georgia Tech's radio station, and there was Fiona Bloom. She was another one who oh, helped play. She was on 89.3. Yeah, exactly. Radio Free Georgia. <laughs> yep. Yep. The, all of these people, all college and commercial. And, and that was the thing across the country with Outcast. It was the college radio stations that gravitated. And, and the reason being is because we could get them on the show. Like, they can get Outcast because we're trying to break them so they can get those interviews done. Right. You know, and they can get drops from us. You know what I'm saying? So it, it really helped. Uh, a break the boys back at that particular point in time. College radio was. So do you, you know, think? Do you think college radio is needed now? 
I, I, absolutely. I still feel that like college radio is very relevant. What, so what, what do you think one of the reasons why indie artists don't use radio? Because they don't know. They don't know. Really? I don't think they know. I know. I think they they want to go straight to the internet, go straight to the DSPs, and straight to internet radio. They don't think about that, and 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 for good reason because they're thinking that terrestrial radio station is too expensive to get. But I tell people that I consult all the time: go after the college radio stations, Mm -hmm. go after the community radio stations. They will give you interviews. Right. They will play your music. They want to play your music, especially if it's dope. Do you think the internet again? has taken over the spot of college radio, and that's probably why they don't think it. They're like, I'm not going to college radio when I could just upload my shit on I Spotify. honestly just feel like they don't know. Mm-hmm. Right. I believe They don't too. know. If if they knew, they could walk right up there to, to WRES, right up there to WREK, right over there to Little Five Points WRFG, and get their, their music played. And there are other college radio stations around yeah. this area uh, that you can go and get your music played. They have hip-hop shows but they don't know they don't know okay that's it for me man because i'm gonna talk to you all day <laughs> man i can stay here boy we'll be here for yeah. three more hours yeah, yeah. so um, no okay i do have one i do have, so again i want to fast forward to now because you've seen so much right right where is ian burke now what is what is ian trying to do now what are we well, doing because we talk all the time off the air about, absolutely yeah i ian will call me like man i'm trying to do this you do a lot <laughs> So what are yeah, we on now? You, you still uh, got hold, your hand. I got to hold them up. Oh, my, my gotta man. Hold, got to hold it up. <laughs> yeah, man. Shout out I to believed Motel. in this from the very beginning. Facts. Roach Motel. Facts. Facts. Understand that. They did this all the t- early recordings of the shows at Icon Studios with DC Young Fly, uh, Carlos, and uh, Chico. Chico Bean. Yep. You know, all doing I believe in this from the beginning. I think the people are stupid for not picking up on that, and that is all I have to say. That is it. That is all. I got. I got one more before we go too. I got. I think this is very important. What do you think it takes for guys like us to stay relevant in this industry right now? Stay one step ahead of the game. And to answer your question, for me, it was moving up and and pursuing film and television. Yep. Okay. You know what I'm saying? You you have to you always have to stay one step ahead of the game. You have to have people talking about you and I learned about that. Social media plays a part in that as well. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Social right. media cuz you know people pay attention to that. Right. And um but I got into the whole in 2020, you know when I was dibbling and dabbling in film when 2020 came and we're all sitting on our asses in the house trying to figure out what to do mm-hmm. next with our lives. Right. You know, the whole thing came into to play with with uh, uh, film and television. And, you know, my brother had some money. And we decided to to create this concept called The Aquatic. It's a scripted TV show mm-hmm. that, that uh, Filthy has been helping me so much trying to get out there. It's fire. I mean, y'all know. cut me in and cut it out. That's it. <laughs> you know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody. Yeah, exactly. You know, we, we're reaching out. We're... we're newbies to it you know we, we we're trying to connect the dots it's not as easy as we may have thought back then but mm-hmm. we still keep pushing it's like the music industry too they, them boys that sell you a dream them, oh them, yeah real oh, quick yeah. them caucasoids boy. Yeah, you, oh stop uh, playing talk <laughs> just just talk 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 <laughs> make it sound good <laughs> you know so um but yeah um that that's pretty much how I work to stay as relevant as possible. I mm. try to, to keep my face out there. I still try to come to events. Like, I, every now and then, you know, I'll pull yeah. up. Yeah, you pull up, yeah, today. no doubt. DJ Smooth and Filthy Rich show me so much love when I walk in the room. And that's, you we know, that you, helps me remain but, relevant. But with us being older, do you find it harder to stay relevant? It's much harder. You know what I'm saying? Because we're not in there actively doing what some of these younger cats are right. doing. It's a uh, what have you done for me lately. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, so people are still like, uh, yeah, I know him, and he did a lot of things back in the day, but what is he <laughs> doing now? now? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm working really hard to get my docuseries out there, uh, my docuseries about the early days in the Atlanta music okay. scene and my involvement in that. You know what I'm Just saying? Just make sure they don't forget me. Oh, absolutely <laughs> not. No, we, we, we still got a lot of interviews to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No you doubt. Know what I'm no saying? doubt. So, um, but I do have a sizzle piece that's out, and I have some things in the works, you know, that I can't speak on yet because it's not solidified yet. But um, I, I think that people are, are going to be able to at least get to see a piece of it and, mm-hmm. and enjoy it. And then, you know, hopefully it'll grow from there. Okay. You know? 
Dope. This is Black Hollywood. This is where all the films are, are being made now. So we got to get in there. Yeah, so, we gotta so, get so, so do you you think Atlanta is more of a a media center now more than a record a record? Definitely, hub? definitely. You know, look, Tyler Perry just bought BET and VH1. Right. The goat. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He's based here in Atlanta. You can't take that away from him. You know, you have Will Packer doing his thing still here. Mm -hmm. Rob Hardy, who was Will Packer's uh, uh, former partner in Rainforest, he's still out there directing all the shows. I mean, you right. see him on Power. You know what I'm saying? Ghost, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, all the the superhero. He, he, he and and all that stuff is being done here in Atlanta too, right? No, no, it's doing. It's being done. He's he's based here. Based here, but he's going to to uh, Canada and shooting Dude, a lot of okay. that superhero stuff and stuff okay. like that. So he's doing some stuff here, but you know he's he's a, but but his base is here is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and there there are a few other people. That that are are doing big things. Of course, you know all the Marvel films right. are done here. Mm -hmm. Like I sit back and I'd be like, oh, yo, yeah, I recognize that. I recognize that, that. Yeah. right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, you know, some of the Fast and the Furious films were mm -hmm. shot here. You know what I'm saying? You know so, why, right? That tax, tax, tax credit. Yeah. Oh yeah, that, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the yo. tax credit. And Dallas, Dallas helped make that happen too. You know, uh, made that whole tax credit happen. Yeah. Without Wait, Dallas. what? Break that Dallas, down. Dallas helped. That, he helped make that happen. Yeah, he was part of the whole the whole legislation yeah, that made the whole that whole legislation. Yeah, when he did uh, ATL and, and a drumline. Drumline. Mm -hmm. That far back. Yeah, that's how long they've been doing that tax credit. Mm -hmm. Damn, that's fire. I didn't know that. So, being that you are in that industry and you kind of dibbling your hands in it now. What would you say to somebody young that really wants to try to get in that industry right now? What would be the first thing they would need to do? Uh, educate yourself. Educate yourself about what it what it takes. They need to know that legislation. Mm -hmm. um, they need to, um, you know, you know, depending on what it is that they want to do. I, I consider myself. I took my contacts from the music industry, and I what I what I did in the music business. What I found out that I was good at was connecting the dots, mm -hmm. putting people with with people. Mm -hmm. So that. That ain't Effectively <laughs> is 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 a, a producer right. in the film industry. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, learn what it is that, that you're good at mm. and then follow that course. You know what I'm saying? So if you're a young person, you want to be a camera person or you want to be a producer or you want to be a director, you got to learn the craft. Yeah, you got to do that. You know what I'm saying? And once again, there's plenty of information out there for you to learn. Absolutely. Mm. You know? Mix that information with the hustle. That's that's it. That's Gotta it. have the hustle. Yeah, yep. You can't yeah. just be book smart. Straight oh, yeah. up. All right, so before we get out of here, we got to play this game that we do <laughs> on the show. Test your black card. We're going to test, test your, your black, black card. card. Let me turn it in right now. <laughs> no, nah, man, listen. Don't do you that. Don't turn it in already. This. Okay. I believe in you. So uh, the way the game is, I'm going to ask you five questions. Okay. You have 15 seconds to answer each question, and these questions are just based on things that you should know if you're black. Right. Okay. All right. Ready with the timer? Yep, let me get the clock out. Let me go. <laughs> All right, you ready? I'm going to right, listen. I'm going to tell you, like I said, I believe in you, Ian. Okay. All right, I All believe right. in you. All right, I'm going right. to keep that. First question. <laughs> don't, give him no, don't give him the easy ones. Okay. Yeah, give First me the question. easy ones. <laughs> List three black reality shows. Love and Hip Hop. Uh, um, uh, growing Up Hip Hop. Uh, Housewives of Atlanta. Nice. All right. That's hard because I don't like watch them. Uh, <laughs> list three black line dances. The slide, electric slide. Um, uh, shake it to the left, to the left, to the. I I I I can't. I don't know it's the electric slide. You got the bus stop. The bus stop. Okay. All right. His time's up already. Yeah. 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 The, the, wobble. I, the wobble. The wobble. Yeah. yeah. Wobble, baby. Right. Wobble, baby. He's one for yeah. two. Yeah. One, one for two, two on his black I, card. I, I, that's what it was, buddy. Shout out to Buddy, the producer back there. There it is. There it is. <laughs> All right. Ready? Yeah. yeah. List three black fashion designers. Mm. Oh, shoot, man. This is easy. Um, walk aware. <laughs> <laughs> no, that nigga old. <laughs> Um, and, oh, my. that's 15 seconds already. Yep. Damn. Okay. Yeah. So Carl Kanai. Yeah, Carl Kanai. I thought you were going to Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't think of It's the pressure. It's the pressure. Yeah, the pressure. Don't get the pressure. That's one for three. One for three. All right. You got two more. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Carl is looking like he's about to get took, man. Okay. Make your comeback. All right. Name three black shows from the 90s. Uh, Hanging with Mr. Cooper, um, Moesha. 
and um, uh, uh, fudge. Oh, uh, God, dog it. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Martin. Right at the buzzer. <laughs> all right, all right. At the buzzer. Oh, my at the God. Buzzer. So is this a tiebreaker? Was he two and two? No, he's uh, uh, two I'm for three four. And two. two for four. Two for four. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm two for four? Yep. Oh, shoot. Okay. Yeah. You got to get this one. You do. Okay. This is for the, the win. This, this for the win. This for the card. You're Ian Burke. Mm-hmm. So you got this. Okay. Hey, Ian. Yes, sir. I believe in you. <laughs> All right. This is good. This is easy. Name three dark skin Michael Jackson songs. Uh, Thriller, uh, Off the Wall, um, and uh, Rock With You. There we go. Come on, man. That was easy. That was I had to save my OG, man. That was easy. I, I can't have yeah, Ian going he down saved bad. He saved you. That's my dog, man. I said, oh, he saved him. Look, if anybody else out to cook their ass, man. <laughs> I said, he was oh, on the edge. I was on I the edge. gonna take that black card. He said, hey, I guess I said, he gave him a real easy black question. I did, I did, I did. That's my dog. I appreciate that. Come on, man. So um now we appreciate you coming out, bro. Oh, my pleasure, man. Let my everybody pleasure. know where they can find you. Uh you can find me. Uh social media is the best way. My Instagram is Ian F. Burke. That's I-A-N-F-B-U-R-K-E. Um, and understand this, if you want to, uh, have a conversation with me, if you follow the link in my bio, click the link in my bio, um, you can schedule a free consultation call with me and, uh, I will give you a call and we'll talk, uh, I'll answer whatever questions you may have in 15 minutes. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, I, I offer that service to all folks who just want to learn a little bit more about what I do mm -hmm. and how I do it. You know what I'm saying? So if you're interested and, and learning more about me, go to the link on my, my, my uh, Instagram page, click it, schedule a call, and I'll call you. Mm, yeah. Super dope, man. Make sure y'all tap in with Ian, too. It's a lot of, um, we, we always talk about people don't know who to go to. This is one of the guys that, listen, he's This proven. is the go-to guy. This is the go-to go -to guy. guy. Yeah, listen, you, I, check I am, your resume. I'm trying to put myself out there for, your, for you young folks who are serious about your careers. You know what I'm saying? If you're serious about it, call me. Let's have a conversation. See, and look at that, because what they say is, ah, man, these old niggas, they don't show the young niggas no love. Listen, he's telling you right now. Right now. He's here. He's here. So shout out to Ian Burke, man. Make sure y'all hit him up. We back next week. This is the We Outside Show. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe, all platforms at the We Outside Show. We gone. All right.